From KGW News, this is Straight Talk with Laurel Porter. Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. You've probably heard something about the president's more than $2 trillion infrastructure plan. He's appealing to Americans to think big. The president says the American Jobs Plan includes money to fix America's roads and bridges, create millions of jobs, and a whole lot more. It's not a plan that tinkers around the edges. It's a once in a generation investment in America. Unlike anything we've done since we built the interstate highway system and won the space race decades ago. It's the single largest investment in American jobs since World War II. Critics say the president's plan pushes the boundaries of what could be considered infrastructure and will add to the national debt. The Trojan horse for massive tax increases and a whole lot of more debt. While the White House says it's just good policy that most Americans want and the cost would be offset by increased corporate revenues raised over 15 years. If it passes, what's in it for Oregon and Southwest Washington? Would the plan include building a new Interstate 5 bridge over the Columbia? The more than 100-year-old bridge is on the busiest road on the West Coast and is critical to freight travel. And it could collapse in a major earthquake. Oregon's own 4th District Congressman Peter DeFazio has been in discussions with the President and Vice President about the plan, as DeFazio is in a powerful position as Chair of the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. Welcome to my guest, Oregon Congressman Peter DeFazio, joining us from his office in D.C. Congressman, it's great to have you back here on Straight Talk. Hey, Laurel, thanks. Always enjoy the conversation. Well, thank you, Congressman. We want to let our viewers know we're taping this Thursday afternoon. It's evening there in D.C. Congress is in session. So if they hear a bell ring during our interview, not to be alarmed, the bell signals a vote has been called. And we understand you've had a few already today. We appreciate you joining us during this busy time. Sure, no problem. Well, let's just jump right in and talk about infrastructure. You are the king of the hill when it comes to infrastructure. You're considered the expert. So let's fill our viewers in just a bit on what you've already done. You spearheaded the Invest in America Act last year, which became the centerpiece for a one and a half trillion dollar bill that passed the House. You talked to the Biden team about it, and a lot of it is now in the president's new American jobs plan. What is your overall impression of President Biden's infrastructure package? How would you describe it. Well, he said it was generational. I would say it's uh, it's you know it's the biggest thing we've done uh, in a hundred years, uh, probably since uh, FDR, the New Deal uh, recovery. Uh, this is uh, long overdue. I mean, uh, I we've been talking about the need uh, for decades. Uh, roads, uh, you know, forty percent of the national highway system needs rebuilding from the base up, not just resurfacing. And we've got to rebuild it resilient to severe weather events, sea level rise, climate change issues. Uh, you know, we have forty thousand bridges on the national highway system that need significant repair or replacement. Hundred billion dollar backlog in transit, uh, and uh, that's just to bring transit up to a state of good repair. Not even build out new options for people to help them get out of congestion, get out of their cars. Uh, the federal government hasn't partnered uh, significantly in wastewater since the 1980s when I was a county commissioner. Uh, and we have massive unmet needs for wastewater, drinking water uh, around the country. So this would be a huge uh, boost to that. And, and the best elements are, has the strongest Buy America requirements of any part of the federal government. And it's going to create, uh, according to Moody's, a couple of million more extra jobs, high paying jobs under Davis Bacon wages. We saw a picture at the top of the show in March. You met with President Biden, Vice President Harris and Transportation Secretary Buttigieg in the Oval Office. Mm -hmm. What did you talk about? What was that meeting like? Well, uh, the president laid out his vision. Uh, he had asked me what issues would be problematic with the Republicans. And I told him, I said, they, they you know, they can't say they believe in climate change. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've got to make a business case for electrifying the national highway network. And that's where he started out. He said, hey, China's going electric. Uh, they're going to eat our lunch uh, if we don't, uh, you know, if we don't begin to catch up in the production of uh, electric automobiles in electrifying our system and build these systems that we can sell to other countries who are going to get on that path. Uh, and so I'm trying to make the business case to Republicans, my committee. I had a hearing two weeks ago, the business case. 
I had the, the, the very conservative Republican who runs FedEx come in. He's going all electric, I think, by 2030, including his semis, uh, our 35. And uh, there's no place to charge him. Uh, and GM's going all electric. Where are we going to charge him? So we're trying to bring the Republicans along and lessen their objections. They don't have to say it's because of climate change. They, I mean, they want to do resilience. They're worried about sea level rise and severe weather events. They still don't have to say it's climate change. Uh, but uh, they do recognize the need to invest. So this is also about American competitiveness. Oh, absolutely. I mean, are you kidding me? Uh, you know, uh, on a daily basis, uh, you know, of our 59 largest harbors, we only have 38% capacity. We can't even accommodate some of the new uh, ships like the one that got stuck in the, uh, in the Suez Canal. Uh, that's where the industry is going. People don't know how dependent we are both as an export nation and as an import nation on seaborne commerce, which, by the way, is the most efficient way to move freight. Um, and we've got to be competitive with the world. That means our harbors. Uh, you know, we have just-in-time delivery. Our corporations uh, do not want delayed product because of detours around bridges that have collapsed or are weight limited. Uh, people are tired of tot potholes. They're tired of water mains that blow up. They're tired of sewers backing up into their house. People want to see these investments and they want to see the jobs it's going to create. They want a difference in their daily lives. Well, you mentioned some of the things in this plan. Let's take a look. It's chock full of investments. Here's a look at some of where the two trillion dollars would be spent from not only roads and bridges to jumpstarting transit projects, rebuilding school buildings and hospitals, replacing lead pipes. As the congressman mentioned, upgrading the nation's water system to creating jobs while building the nation's clean energy workforce and expanding manufacturing. We mentioned the electric vehicles, 174 billion would go toward that and 500,000 charging stations. It would also boost caregiving for older Americans and people who are disabled and boost pay for caregivers. Congressman, one of the Republicans' big criticisms is the huge price tag that includes a lot of things they think go far beyond the scope of infrastructure like caregiving and pay for caregivers. What do you think? Do you support everything in it? Well, the president is trying to uh, target problems with include uh, and improve the quality of life uh, for many Americans, things that have been neglected. I get to write the part that goes to, I guess, what the Republicans would say is real infrastructure, roads, bridges, highways, transit, uh, railroads, uh, wastewater, uh, airports, harbors. Uh, that's my section. That's the part I deliver. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're trying to bargain back and say, well, why don't you put those other things, which they consider non-infrastructure or soft infrastructure, uh, in another package, and maybe we'll deal on, on the stuff DeFazio is working on. So I, I'm not sure how this all works out, but we have been waiting too long uh, to deal with our deteriorated infrastructure. I mean, we are, we're 15th in the world. We used to be the envy of the world. Uh, with our rail systems, our transit systems, our highway systems, 15th in the world. And, and our current level investment is going to have us dropping, dropping further down. Let's drill down to the Pacific Northwest. Oregon got a C minus and Washington got a C on an infrastructure report card. What's in this for Oregon and Southwest Washington? How would it affect people's lives right here in the Pacific Northwest? Well, you mentioned, I think, in the intro, the uh, bridges across the Columbia likely to fall down uh, in an earthquake, uh, outmoded uh, insufficient capacity. Uh, you know, I worked on that uh, a number of years ago before the plane collapsed. I kept cautioning them to like try and limit the price. We had a commitment from the feds for $750 million. Patty Murray and I worked out uh, to pay for the light rail over the bridge. Washington state didn't like the light rail. Uh, they're again meeting on this between the two states. They, they've got to get their act together and come up with a plan because the president says they are going to rebuild the 10 most economically significant bridges in America. And I can sure make the case that the CRC, Columbia River Crossing, is well up in that list of the top 10. I don't know, you know, it might be five, who knows? We'll, we'll find out how it gets scored. Uh, but then we've got other problems, uh, 205, we've got a, a bridge on 205 where the, the highway has to be limited down to two lanes, causes huge backups. ODOT says we don't have the money to do that. Uh, we've got to get, you know, I mean, the states can't do this stuff on their own. These are interstate highways, interstate highways. You know, they're not, you know, within one state. So the federal government needs to be a better partner. The federal government 
hasn't significantly increased its investment since 1993. Uh, come on, we got to get with it. If you had to place a bet, what are the odds that the I-5 bridge will get rebuilt in your lifetime, do you think? How much influence do you have? Well, I just, the, the governor was uh, in Eugene last week and I had a chat with her and I said, you know, you, your people have to, you know, get this moving, get moving quick because uh, the Biden plan is going to look at uh, potentially, we, we don't know, uh, uh, minimally a five-year window, uh, maximally maybe a little longer. So we need a plan to present. You know, I got uh, Oregon to Vancouver, B.C., designated uh, one of the first five high-speed rail corridors in the United States back in the 1990s. Oregon has put nothing into it. Uh, Washington State has done a better job. There's now a new plan uh, from, uh, you know, that's coming from Washington State, being driven by them. I think Oregon is following along uh, for that high-speed rail. Uh, again, up to Vancouver. They keep talking about Portland. And I say, no, no, the original route went to Eugene. Uh, you know, if we, you know, we don't even have to have high speed rail. If we had dependable higher speed rail, you know, if I get on Amtrak in Eugene, it's scheduled for almost three hours. That's 112 miles. The train can go 112 miles an hour, but the trackage isn't there. Uh, and they have to conflict with freight. Uh, we have to deal with these things. And, uh, you know, if they could get me there reliably in two hours, I'd never get on I-5 again. I mean, yeah, I can beat I can beat two hours on I five on a really good day. There's other days when it's going to take me way longer because of all the accidents that happen on I five or two hundred five going to the airport. Imagine if I could take take Amtrak uh, down to Union Station in Portland and the, and then take a, you know transit out to the airport. A lot of people would do that. I think a lot of people would join you on that train. Not to confuse <laughs> things, but you are really focused on yet another transportation bill right now that you said needs to pass by October 1st. It's a transportation mm -hmm. reauthorization bill with a $500 billion price tag. What's different about this and why is this bill so important to pass quickly? Well, um, you know, they're talking in the Senate about reconciliation. It's, it's a bizarre process. It's a rule written 37 years ago by a senator who's been dead for 11 years. A bird from West Virginia, uh, and then the, the, the parliamentarian holds a seance with him to try and figure out what can go in or out of a bill. A lot of the policy changes we want to make to deal with climate change, electrification, new program, can't go in the can't go in uh, the bird rule. Uh, you know, uh, a whole host of the things, the social equity uh, programs the president wants, uh, so we don't divide or we deal with communities that were divided intentionally in the past by interstates that have now aged out or bridges that have aged out that we could replace and rejoin those communities won't work under the bird rule. So my reauthorization has to carry all of the policies that President Biden wants. So it's actually one in the same from my perspective. Um, you know, my invest act or whatever we're going to call it this time around is going to incorporate all of what the president wants for roads, bridges, highways, transit, rail, airports, harbors, wastewater. Um, so it's essentially one and the same coming out of my committee. Uh, but the key thing is to get the Senate to agree to it. Yeah, they're going to bargain back. Maybe they're going to say it's too much or we don't want to do this or that. But if I can keep the core programs, then later they can be funded through this bizarre reconciliation process. I hate the way things work around here sometimes, but the Senate is totally dysfunctional. And you plan to bring this up in May, sometime in May? Yep, uh, probably the third week in May. Well, to pay for his plan, President Biden wants to raise the corporate income tax rate to 28 percent and increase the minimum tax on multinational corporations to 21 percent. Critics have said that would reduce the nation's competitiveness abroad and hurt small businesses and job creation at home at a time when the nation's trying to recover from the pandemic. Now, I know you're not on the Ways and Means Committee. That's where Congressman Blumenauer sits. But what do you think, Congressman DeFazio? Is, is that the best way to pay for the plan? Look, Laurel. The 55 most profitable corporations in America paid negative income taxes last year. They didn't pay anything. In fact, their net uh, taxes were negative. They got money back from past year's taxes because of the Trump policies. The Trump policies actually included new uh, provisions to encourage them to offshore manufacturing. That's what the president is talking about repealing get rid of the Trump stuff that encourages corporations to go overseas and let's have them all pay their fair share. I don't think any American, I mean, and someone who works for the minimum wage, the first dollar they earn, their tax rate is higher than the 55 largest corporations in America. I don't think Americans think that's fair. 
And small businesses did not do great under this plan. This was mostly large corporations and people who earned over $400,000 a year. The president has pledged not a penny in new taxes if you earn less than $400,000 a year. Uh, they've done a lot for small business in the, in the recent rescue package. Uh, they're not the target. The target are huge corporations, multinational corporations who aren't paying their fair share and people who earn over $400,000 or the billionaires in the country who more than doubled their wealth in the last year. You were recently named the second most effective lawmaker in Congress by the nonpartisan Center for Effective Lawmaking. Congratulations on that. And you were recognized for your efforts to pass bipartisan legislation. Do you think you'll be able to shepherd through your reauthorization bill and the president's plan with bipartisan support? Again, it, it depends upon uh, on my side in, in my committee, uh, whether the Republicans can abide uh, dealing with fossil fuel pollution uh, you know, and uh, and looking at the kinds of increases in investments we need and also the new social equity programs. Uh, I'm trying to work with them. I'm reaching out. Uh, we're, we're joining together on doing what we call member designated projects. Uh, and we're in a constant dialogue. Uh, it's a work in progress. We've got a few more weeks to hammer some things out. I'm hoping uh, they'll get on board ultimately uh, to get a reauthorization through the Senate, it is going to have to be over there bipartisan unless they do away with the filibuster. So at some point, it's going to end up being bipartisan. Congressman, it's time for us to take a break. We'll continue our conversation with Congressman Peter DeFazio, including how he's leading the way to make air travel safer following the Boeing 737 MAX tragedies. And we'll find out about a visit to Eugene with the nation's second gentleman. We're back in two minutes. Three hundred and forty-six sons, daughters, brothers, sisters, fathers, mothers who died on Lion Air Flight 610 and Ethiopian Flight 302 placed their trust in a broken system. Today, we take the next big step toward fixing that system. Welcome back to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. We're talking with Oregon 4th District Congressman Peter DeFazio. Congressman, we just heard you talking about legislation you've been really passionate about. It addressed the Boeing 737 MAX tragedies. Those two air crashes killed 346 people, as you mentioned, and you led a bipartisan bill that, in your words, is intended to fix a broken system. And it moved through Congress, was signed into law pretty quickly. How important is it and how will it make air travel safer? Uh, it is the most important change in the way uh, we certify a new aircraft uh, into the air uh, in the history of aviation in this country. Um, unfortunately, Boeing, uh, with their uh, new management a number of years ago, became more of a finance company uh, than a great engineering company. They had formerly been the greatest engineering company in the world for aviation, uh, and uh, they drove uh, their engineers to push out a product they drove them to conceal uh, you know, a system that would take over the plane. It wasn't even in the pilot's manual. I can't tell you how angry the pilots from American Airlines were after the first crash when they found out there was a system that would take the plane over from them that was very difficult to disable. And Boeing said, oh, we didn't want to give you too much information. Um, and then they said, oh, well, there's really no problem with this now that you know about it. Here's how you can disable it. Uh, that didn't work in the second crash. Uh, and this was all driven by greed uh, by the execs uh, who were looking at their, their bonuses and, and Wall Street. In fact, the guy who ran the company and killed all those people, he left with a $63 million golden parachute. That's obscene. So, you know, and, and what they did is they hurt the company. They hurt the tens of thousands of workers they have, the great engineers, the mechanics, everybody else who works for them. We're going to make sure that never happens again. The FAA was a captive regulator, um, and they were also not uh, competent in terms of uh, Boeing was concealing stuff from them, and they didn't get it. Uh, but Boeing was uh, being intentional about that. So we're changing the system. The FAA is going to exert greater oversight. We're going to change the way we designate people to oversee production and oversee what's going on within a company. Uh, we're, we're going to put in civil fines for anybody who represses information or tries to stop a whistleblower um, and, and a whole host of changes in the way these aircraft are certified. It, it was uh, a major effort. 
I didn't start out bipartisan, but after my committee finished the most ambitious um, you know, investigation in its history of more than 200 years, and we published a report, it became bipartisan very quickly. The Senate withdrew a very weak bill immediately after our report came out. And in the end, agreed to the legislation we wrote to fix the system and make sure this never happens again. And it was signed into law. Uh, we did hear by the, Donald Trump. <laughs> so it was bipartisan. We did hear bells go off. I know you've got a vote coming up. So I did want to get to something uh, in Eugene, in your neck of the woods. The nation's second gentleman, Doug Emhoff, Vice President Harris's husband, came to Eugene earlier this month. He was here to support Oregon's COVID vaccination effort and to highlight how investments from the American Rescue Plan are helping underserved communities. How are those funds helping get shots in arms in Oregon? Well, the Whiteberg Clinic uh, pictured there in Eugene, uh, which does incredibly uh, innovative work with low income people and with communities of color uh, down in, in my part of the state uh, and is actually a tremendous aid to the police. They run something called Cahoots. They take 20% of the 911 calls, mentally ill, uh, drug overdoses. Uh, so the police don't have to respond. Uh, but the White Bird got uh, over $3 million, and they're starting a very innovative program to reach out uh, to the Hispanic community who's been very reluctant down our way to get out there into their communities. They're, they're using some of the money to get a van that's equipped and go out actually to people uh, and be mobile and do this. Uh, and uh, hopefully this model will be replicated around the country. Uh, there was not much money or help coming from the federal government under Trump to help the states, counties, cities and uh, you know community health care centers and things like White Bird uh, to actually go out and administer the shots and pay for at least their overhead. They're not making any money on this, but it's paying for their overhead. And it, we're watching the clock for you in just about a minute. How else have you seen the American Rescue Plan help Oregonians? Well, uh, the individual payments uh, certainly have been very important to many, many Oregonians. Uh, the continuation of the payroll support program for small business, a special new program for restaurants who have been somewhat ignored uh, in the previous bills and took probably the, the greatest hit of any sector uh, of the economy uh, through this whole pandemic. Uh, you know, that's, uh, and, and that also includes breweries. I am the co-chair of the House Craft Brewers Caucus and co-founder, so they'd been left out too. Uh, and taking a big hit on their employment. We're down, I mean, well over 100,000 people between breweries and restaurants uh, in employment in Oregon. Uh, this will bring back a lot of those jobs. It'll help uh, some of those businesses uh, continue to work. We were at a restaurant uh, later uh, that uh, day, uh, and uh, he, uh, Hamid talked about how it had been absolutely essential. He would have gone, he would have shut his doors if he hadn't had the payroll support program, and now with the enhanced program, He's hiring back his whole staff. Uh, that's 16 more jobs. Congressman, we have to ask you before you go, you have a new furry member of your family. We, <laughs> we hear you have a new puppy. That's Waldo. He's so cute. Tell us a little bit about Waldo. Well, we've, we've had adopted dogs. And, you know, one good thing about the crisis has been that everybody's adopting dogs. And our adopted two adopted dogs died just before and just after COVID. Uh, and then we tried to adopt another. It was it, we couldn't find one. So ultimately, we uh, we got a puppy. Uh, and uh, you know, puppyhood is always challenging. But uh, he's a he's a wonderful guy, uh, and he's going to be he's going to be a great dog. He's he's now seven months. Uh, he's now a big puppy. That was when he was about uh, six or seven weeks. Uh, so well, a little ten weeks, I think, at that point. Uh, and Waldo was an appropriate name, but the people who, uh, who bred him said that whenever the puppies were out, he would disappear. And so that <laughs> her kids would say, where's Waldo? And so he became Waldo. I was going to have to ask you that. Where is Waldo? He's at your home in Oregon. <laughs> well, we yeah, hear he's the, down in Springfield with my wife. We yeah. hear the, the, the bells ringing. I think you have to go vote. Yeah. So Congressman Peter DeFazio, we made it through. Thank you for joining us here on Straight Talk. Come back and see us again and good luck there in D.C. Thanks, Laurel. Really enjoyed the talk. Have a great day. Thank you for watching. And remember, you can listen to Straight Talk as a podcast now. It's available wherever you get your podcasts. Search for KGW Straight Talk. Next week, we're talking vaccines as everyone in Oregon and Washington becomes eligible for the vaccine. Our KGW vaccine team, Pat Doris and Kristen Severance, will have the latest on the rollout. We'll see you next week for Straight Talk. Have a great week.